Hey, first of all, some announcement quickly, and then I will go to the final part for the review. Okay, I want to mention that I just posted some notes for you. That's something I would expect you to be familiar with for the coming programming lab test. I'm gonna over the weekend or latest mon uh, Monday, the latest. I'm gonna give you some guidance as to how you can pr prepare for the programming uh, lab test, which is gonna be far away, but I think it's get it better to get prepared sooner than later. Sooner than later. Okay, I'll refer you to the notes quickly. So if you look at the uh, lectures website, okay, that's the website for lectures. And then you will see that under uh, the table over here, there's a note called point, point collector, and point collector tester. That's the thing I just added uh, yesterday. Basically, this is some example to go, go very thoroughly through how you can create a class, and also another class, which would be an array of that particular class, okay? So you got two classes to manipulate. That's something I would expect you to be familiar with by the time we have the lab test, okay? And I'm gonna talk about it for sure today as well, but only briefly. And then I can also refer you to some videos for the tutorial, you can also study them. You have enough time, but I'm just telling you earlier, okay? Let's go back to here and also, yeah, I'm gonna, t again, I keep emphasizing this particular Java tutorial series. For those of you who came to my office, I'm glad some of you actually finished the videos, that's good, or you started to watch the videos, I do encourage you to do it, okay? Of course, if you're really comfortable with Java, you don't have to, but I re recommend. If you're not comfortable, you should watch them, okay, to get your background solid. Okay, let's go back to the lecture. Basically, this is where we finished. So last time, basically, we talked about how you can visualize objects by drawing boxes, and how you can trace reassignments of objects using uh, arrows and also changing your arrows. That's basically what we did uh, on Monday, okay? Basically, we have seen many manipulations up to this point, okay? That's something I assume you're okay. If you're not okay, watch the recording or come to me for uh, help, okay? I would like to continue with this a little bit, uh, a little bit more before I move, move on to the next one. Okay, basically up to here, what we get is a runtime structure like this. I redraw it so it's much cleaner. It's 100% uh, clean. Basically what we have is as follows. We have one, two, three, and four. We have four objects of type person. And we have one array pointing to different uh, objects over here. We have another array pointing to different objects as well. Okay, so now, I have a question for you, which is I didn't really organize very nicely at the end. Let's answer that properly. The following question, try to see if you can answer. I want to know how many alias paths are now pointing to the object for Alan. How many? I heard three. Okay, three is a good number in this case. The way to see that, basically I'm asking how many arrows are pointing to this object over here, how many? One, two, and three. Agree? Okay, that's, number, that's step number one. And step number two. Let's identify those arrows and write them out as valid expressions in Java. That's something I would expect you to do, uh, maybe in the written test, okay? So now, this is one pointing to Alan. This is another one pointing to Alan. This is just another one pointing to Alan. So these are the three. How do we write them out as valid expressions? The easiest one is simply say uh, Alan. Okay, Alan itself stores the address for this object over here, right? Okay, can you give me another one? Let's say, what about the path that corresponds to this arrow? How do I write a path? Anybody? Persons one at index zero, absolutely. Persons one at position zero. And what about the final one? Persons two at position two. Very good, thank you. It's not hard as long as you know how to trace the code using visualization as I try to teach you. Two, thank you, absolutely. Be careful when you write in the lab test, right? Okay. As you can see, this may not be so easy just to execute the code in Eclipse. Eclipse. Eclipse may not help you too much. You have to know how to trace the code, okay? That's really how I test your thorough understanding, okay? 
Okay, you can try to do other uh, example as well. So now I want to move on a little bit more with uh, the complete coding. Okay, so now we say persons one at position zero and set the age to be seventy. Persons one is here at position zero. Follow the link. You're going to get this particular object. Change the age to be seventy, I believe. Okay, that's what we are doing over here. Right? That's a that line. Given that you have already drawn the diagram, so you have to uh, everything else should be quite easy. So now, if I say system out of print line, gym that age, it should be zero. Okay, that's easy. And what about uh, Allen that age? Seventeen, right? Good, very good. Yeah. And then, what about persons two zero that age? Okay, persons two at position zero dot h zero, right? Zero over here. And let's now do a little bit of reassignments, okay? What does it really mean? When I say persons one zero is assigned to Jim, let me write it out. When I say uh, persons one zero is assigned to Jim, let me make sure I write it out, okay? What does it really mean? What arrow am I trying to change? Am I trying to, trying to change the arrow for Jim or persons one or persons one zero? Good, because that's the left hand side of the assignment, right? Persons one at position zero is now referring to this particular slot, first of all, right? Rather than pointing to here, it's now going to point to where Jim is currently pointing to. Jim is currently pointing to this object over here, so I'm going to let it point to over here. Let me draw a little bit better. Okay, are we are you comfortable with this? Okay, so now after this change, we say persons one zero dot set age seventy five. Okay, persons one at position zero dot set age 75. Okay, let's try to analyze this dot notation over here carefully. Basically, what we're doing here is, first of all, go to persons one, which is persons one is referring to this particular starting point of the array, and go to position zero, which is here. And then you want to call, uh, okay, and then you say dot. Dot means go to wherever the address is pointing to. It's pointing to this particular object over here. Okay, up to here. And then set the age for this particular object to 75. No, Persons one, okay, I'm so sorry. Absolutely. You see, everybody can make mistake, right? This is not intentional though. I really make mistake. Let me do it again, please. Persons one at position zero is now really pointing to this particular object over here. And then dot means go to wherever this project is pointing to, which is here. And then set the age to be 75. Agree? Very good. Hopefully everybody's happy now. Good. And then gym.h, 75, right? Because now we got alias. Jim and persons one at position zero, these two arrows point to the same objects, okay? And now, finally, if I ask, what's Alan at age? 70, right? Okay, the same, just uh, to double check. And what about this? Persons two, zero dot age. Persons two, zero dot age would be? Zero, good. You see, once you got a diagram updated properly, and make sure you can read the uh, arrows, not like me, right? You can read it, you should be okay, okay? Of course, in the test, I might change the layout a little bit, maybe, maybe, maybe by making a little bit more layers for you, but the principle is really the same. Okay, any question about aliasing in general? Any questions? So we started with what does it really mean for reference variable to store address, and what does it really mean for changing the address that, that's being stored by redraw, uh, redrawing the arrow. And then we do complicated example like this, right? That's, that's a gradual pace over here. And I do have some additional exercise for you on the slides, okay? 
We wouldn't do it uh, in the lecture, but if you want me to do it together with you, drop by my office hour. I'll, I have a whiteboard. I'll do it together with you. I would like you to try this particular example over here, which is kind of similar, but the reassignment might be a little bit more interesting to see. And what I would suggest, print this out into a single page, cover the answer. Pretend as if it's a test question. Draw the diagram and trace the code and figure out the answer. Okay? That's your exercise. If you got trouble, let me know. Finally, uh, so an object at runtime may have more than one identities, meaning that the same address may be stored for multiple times, different copies in different variables. That's exactly what we're trying to see in the example. Okay, that's aliasing. Okay, if no question, I want to move back a little bit. Since I was actually talking about how to use the this keyword, and somehow you guys were very interested in learning about aliasing, that's why I diverge. Okay, and I want to go back to that particular route. What I would like to do is go back to this particular code here. I do want to finish reviewing how you can trace a constructor, accessor, and mutator, because we're gonna depend on that a lot uh, later in the lecture. Okay, now I'll do that quickly because you pretty much get the idea. Especially, I want to just show you the process of tracing the code, okay? Tracing the code is a very important technique uh, once you get to your advanced level, okay? So now, let me try this. What I will do is, I'm going to tr uh, try to trace these very quickly. Let's say I'm trying to create a new person, so I'm calling, talking about this constructor here. Basically, we are calling the constructor twice, once and twice. For the first time, we're going to create an object over here of type person. And we know that for every person, we have four attributes. We have age, nationality, uh, weights, and heights. Agree? And then we are trying to set the values differently. So 45 is going to be the age over here. And 72 is going to be the weights over here. And 1.72 is going to be the heights over here. Agree? And then every occurrence of age will be 45, every occurrence of weights will be 72, every occurrence of heights will be 1.72. And what about this? What does this really mean in this case? This means the context object that we're dealing with. So which object are we trying to deal with? The orange objects over here, right? So that means this is really referring to this particular orange object over here. And then, for the orange object, change its age field, which is over here, change that to 45. And also, for its weights, change that to 72. And for the heights, change it to 1.72. Okay, and then the nationality will just be null. And then, we have a reference variable, Jim, over here. And Jim is going to store the address for this particular object, right, by the assignments. So we're going to point there. That's the uh, more convenient way to draw, to visualize, as opposed to using a memory diagram, like uh, what I did initially. Okay? Questions about this? Are we OK? Hey, I want to briefly mention that for the second one, we're basically doing the same procedure, except that we're going to create a new object over here, also person. And then also four attributes, right? The same template, age, nationality, weights, and heights. And now this time, 62 is going to be the age. 65 is going to be the weights. And 1.81 is going to be the heights, right? We do the similar assignments, okay? Can I leave you with that? Okay? So that means there's gonna be 62, 65, and 1.81. And also no, I initialized. And now question, what would be the this right now? The orange or the pink? The pink, right? Good. This is really important. So now you're gonna store the address for this particular object we just created into Jonathan. So that means Jonathan is now going to be a separate variable store storing different address over here. So now we got two different things, okay? And by the way, let me just go back to where I was. I forgot to mention just one more thing, okay? When I say these are alias paths to the same objects, if you try to do address comparison using equals equals, they will just be equal. You can try. If I say Alan equals equals persons one at position zero is going to give me true. Okay, it does an address comparison. 
Similarly, if I try to do Jim equals equals Jonathan, what should I get? False. Very good. They simply point to different objects. But as soon as I say Jim is assigned to Jonathan, and then I do Jim equals equals Jonathan again, what should I get? Jim. True. Okay. So it really depends on what code you're talking about. Right? Just a very quick review. Okay, that's about the constructor. I would like to move on to mutator and accessor. I'll talk about both of them at one go. Okay, I also made a uh, I also made the source code available to you. I also want to show you how you can see exactly what we're talking about over here in Eclipse. That's also important to see. Okay, the same person class. Let's see what methods we have. Right, we have one accessor over here. So this is the accessor returning something. It's returning a double. But it does not take any arguments. It does not take any parameters, no input. And this is a mutator returning void, does not return anything. So that's a mutator. And sometimes we call accessor also getters. That's what the Java convention, so you'll say getters. And for mutators, that means change something. It's also called setters. Okay? And so you can see for the accessor over here, we're simply just trying to do some computation for the BMI and then return the BMI, okay? And then for mutator, we don't return anything. We simply just try to typically modify the attribute, for example, this that weights, right? Modify that to something else. That's about a code structure, very basic, okay? We're gonna see more difficult method uh, implementation later, okay? But for now, that'll be enough. What's really important now is to see how we trace the code, okay? I'll trace that with you very carefully. So now the first two lines over here is, very, is basically the same as what we talked about just previously. So now let me be consistent with color. Jim is gonna be pink, and Jonathan is gonna be orange, okay? So now after this particular setup, after the first line, we know that it's gonna be 45, okay? I'm gonna, I already trace it. So 72, and also 1.72. That is simply null for the nationality, okay? And after the second line, we know that it's going to be uh, 62, uh, 65. Oh, sorry, not here. Nationality is null, uninitialized. 65 and 1.72. Okay. Now let's see how we can get the rest of the code being traced. Question. Yeah, you're basically asking us, I know what you mean. You're basically asking the following question. If I say, Jim equals, equal, after, let's say at this point, if I say Jim equals, equals Jonathan, we know very well, false. Let's try something a little simpler and I'll get to your, uh, the one you just suggested. So if I say Jim dot H equals, equals, Jonathan dot h, what would that be? False, right? I'm comparing 45 together with 62, right? So that's false. Okay, uh, actually none of the attributes are the same, so it would just be false. Now let's get to your question. If I simply say Jim dot name, equal, na na nationality, sorry, there's no name. Jonathan dot nationality, okay? So now, what would that be? We're basically comparing now with now. In this case, we're just comparing basically nothing and nothing, just equal. This is a special case, so, so it would just be true. However, be careful. You can try this out yourself, be curious. Let's say, if I expand the constructor a little bit, let's say, okay? If I simply say over here, Jim, okay. Jonathan. That's what we give. We give them some initial string. In this case, if we say, oh, I meant nationality. I don't mean the name. Let me erase this. 
let's say they are both Canadian. Okay, so now, if I try to say Jim dot nationality equals equal Jonathan dot nationality, what would I get? Aha, uh -huh. who's actually said false? Why would you think that's false? It's not the correct answer, but I want to know what you're thinking. You're asking the right question. You know what, this is quite subtle, and I may not cover this thoroughly, but I'll mention that very quickly here, okay? In Java or in any other O language which might accept string literal, first of all, we understand that. I'll try to make some other example to show you the difference, okay? First of all, you know this is a string literal, right? We write it out. This is just another string literal, agree? Okay? For efficiency, when we try to compile the Java code, what the Java compiler will do is to check if there's any string literal that happen to be the same. If they are the same, they are going to create the same objects at the runtime beforehand. So what's going to happen is we're going to get a string objects over here, which is simply just going to be Canadian. And then both of them is simply just going to point to Canadian. It is this case where it is there are str two string literals. However, you might be wondering. Where, under what circumstance will we actually get two separate strings, but both Canadians? That will require a little bit more complicated explanation. I'll leave that maybe for a little bit later. I can create some example to show you, but maybe not today. But as far as this particular example is concerned, if you simply just give literals for the nationality, that's Canadian and Canadian, so they will happen to be the same string at the runtime. Okay? It's a bit tricky, I know. Questions? Well, the integer, you simply just compare the value, right? Let's say if we set up the, uh, val the age for Jim to be 45, and Jonathan's age also 45, and they'll be the same, right? We just compare the value. It's only when you get the reference type that will be a little bit more complicated. Because for reference type, when you say equals, equals, you're really comparing address. Okay. Let me summarize, okay? In case you're not so confident, in Java, when you say equals, equals over here, right? You might have something here. You might have something here, right? What should be the comparison? It depends. Case number one. If both are primitive. For example, you're comparing integer to integer. Compare values in the integer. Right? I and J, if they both store three, doesn't matter if they're separate copy, but just three. Number two, if both are reference type, like uh, addresses, let's say Jim and Jonathan. In that case, we actually compare addresses. In some way, it's not really inconsistent. In the case of the primitive, you're, in both cases, you're comparing whatever that is stored in the variable. In the first case for the primitive, let's say, I'll make it very concrete. Integer i is three, integer j is three. In this case, i is here, j is here, and three and three. You're simply just comparing address here, and oh, sorry, not address, you're comparing the value here and the value here, three and three, they are equal. That one's easy. The second case, again, let's try to re reinforce that. If we simply got Jim and Jonathan, let's say, in this case, because in the previous case, we, all, we simply got two new keywords over here, right? So that means the, this will be address one, and this will be address two. They're simply different addresses. In that case, when you are doing equals equals comparison, you're really trying to see whether address one and address two, they're the same. They are not the same, right? They are diff they're refer referring to different objects. Okay, be careful, okay? Your question might be, to go from this further, for number two, what if I want to compare contents of the objects? The answer is, you need a specialized method called equals, and we'll talk about it, okay? 
But for now, whenever you have equals equals, it depends on what you're really comparing. If you're comparing primitive, compare their values. If you're comparing reference variables, compare the addresses that store. Okay? Are we okay? Good. Yeah. Okay. So now let's now try to trace the code a little bit over here. Okay? I'll try to trace uh, over here. Okay. Okay, what I will do is, okay, let's see. What if I try to say jim.getBMI versus jonathan.getBMI? Let's try to tra trace what's going to be the return value for these two. Okay? The first one, when I say jim.getBMI, this one here, right? jim.getBMI. First of all, what's the context objects? Jim, Jim, right? That's a context object, okay? So Jim is a context object. So dot simply means look at what is stored in, in Jim, which is an address. It simply points to this particular object. So we are really talking about this particular object, where we say Jim dot, right? And now we say get BMI over here. So now we're going to refer to this particular get BMI method. Right? So now you can look at that and you see I deliberately put this. Basically, every time you want to refer to the attribute, you can feel free to put this. You're referring to the attributes. So now when we are making this particular call to get BMI, again, what's this? Hmm? Jim, right? It's a context object. Remember, this is the context object we are talking about. Because we are making this particular method call over here, Jim before the dot is a context object. So that this over here should be just Jim. Everybody with me? Okay, so now if we want to calculate BMI, we're going to say Jim.weights over here, Jim.heights over here, and use that to calculate. The number itself is not important, right? You just want to know which context object you're talking about. Similarly, if I go to the next line over here, now, I'm trying to call the same get BMI method, but am I going to get the same return value? Why is that? Because? Because this, at this, at this moment, points at Jonathan. Yeah, because the context object is different. That's, that's the answer I'm looking for, yeah. Because now for this second method call to get BMI, the context object is now Jonathan. So that means we're calling the same block of code over here, get BMI, but now every occurrence of this is now Jonathan. That's why I put it orange, right? This is now Jonathan, and this is now Jonathan. You can think about we may apply the same formula for calculating BMI for many as many times as we like, but what's important is what's the context objects. It could be Jim, it could be Jonathan, it could be other person objects, right? So now if, I, if we do that, that means we're gonna use the weights and heights from Jonathan, 65 and 1.72. That's why we get different answer. Guys, right, so are we okay? Questions? Yes. 1.8, what, did I write it wrong? Sure, I'm happy to change it. Maybe I wrote it too quick, yeah, 1.81, 1.81, thank you. Sharp eyes, that's nice. Okay, so now, let's now move on. Here's my question for you. I want you to look at these two. I'm saying Jim BMI is assigned to Jim.getBMI. Jonathan BMI is assigned to Jonathan.getBMI, right? Now I'm repeating the same two lines over here. Can you see it? Okay. Are these two lines going to give me the same answer? Are they? Hint for you. Look at what I'm doing, trying to do here, right? Basically, even though you're trying to call the same accessor method with the same context object, for example, you can see over here, I'll show you. Look at this line here, and look at this line here. They are both Jim, oh, okay, they are both calling Jim.getBMI, but are they going to give you the same value? I would say, in general, it depends whether at the point that you're trying to call this particular method with the same context, okay, 
Context objects both gin, no problem, okay? We're calling the same method. Are they going to give me the same answer? It depends. If at a point I'm trying to call this method again, all the attributes for gin remain the same, then that'll be the same answer. If they have been modified since the last call, they will be different, right? It's a very important insight into OO. Okay, let's see what happened here. I'll just trace Jim for you. When I say calling this particular mutator method here, right? I say Jim is a context object and try to call gain weights with three. So now I'm calling gain weights over here. And then the input is simply just three. So amount is simply three. Amount is simply three. And then context object is Jim. Replace every occurrence of this by Jim. So what am I talking about? Jim that waits is referring to this object or this object, pink or orange? Pink, right? Because Jim is referring to this particular object. I want to modify his weights by incrementing by three. So 72 to 75. Okay, so after this, if I try to print out, if I try to get BMI again, am I going to apply the same formula to different numbers or the same number? Different numbers, right? Because the weight has been increased. Okay, that's really the main essence for this example. Okay, I want to show you one more thing in the Eclipse to, uh, to show you. Okay. Maybe we'll do the tracing in the Eclipse a little later, but make sure you understand this on the paper. Okay. So now if I simply go to Eclipse over here, so now uh, everything has been typed out, okay? So what I want to show you is what, what will actually be printed out, okay? So if I right click on person tester run as Java application over here, okay, I just want you to pay attention to this. Basically, for the first call to Jim BMI, we got 24, for example, right? It's correct value, I can tell you. After we have uh, actually called the mutator method to gain weights for Jim for three, after that you get a something that's not the same, just higher, which makes sense. Okay, so when you play with the example, that's what you expect to see. But what's more important is really to see how to trace the code, like how I did it. Okay, because in the lab test, I'm ju I'm just gonna ask you maybe what the output is without using Eclipse. Okay. I may just uh, forbid the use of Eclipse for the written test. For programming test, of course, you gotta use Eclipse. But for the concept test, no Eclipse, maybe. I don't know. But the, the main thing is you wanna know how to do this kind of uh, tracing. It's really important, okay? Guys, any question for me about constructor, this keyword, mutator, accessor, or how to trace method call, okay? Anything unclear to you, you should ask me now. Yes. String objects. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Basically, uh, I would say don't stress over too much with this detail. I'll mention it very briefly. Okay. Yeah. This detail is very subtle, right? I mean, unless you really program for this specific language, otherwise it's a bit. Yeah. Basically, what I'm trying to say is this: when you are writing your code. Let's say you simply got your main method over here, right? I'll make it a little bit uh, simpler to understand. If I simply say string s1 is Alan. String s2 would be Alan as well. So now if I try to print out s1 equals equals s2, Okay. The answer would just be true for the following reason. When Eclipse is trying to analyze your Java code, you will see that you have a string literal called Alan, A-L-A-N. You have another one that's just called the same, just the same, just Alan and A-L-A-N as well. For efficiency reason, at the runtime, S1 and S2 will simply point to the same string called Allen. Just be the same. Okay, that's why the nationality will can, for Canadian, if you write it out directly as string literal, they will turn out to be the same objects. But, but, uh, would this be the same if these weren't string variables? If they were both double variables with value 
it will be the same. If you again, you, you you're really talking about what does it really mean when you say equals equals? If you simply assign what well, the same question, right? If I say double d1 is 2.0, and another double, let's say d2 is 2.0, right? If I say d1 equals equals d2, do I get true or false? True, right? Because you're comparing value. Yeah. <laughs> so when you talk about primitive type, you don't talk about objects. You only talk about objects when you talk about the uh, the instances that you instantiate using the new keyword, right? So there's a difference between primitive and um, and reference. We actually have one slide for that. Okay, let me refer you to the slides. Okay, if you go to the slides, okay. So now, oh, exactly here. That's good. Okay. So what about types in Java? Basically, think of type as the runtime possibility for all the value you can do for a particular variable. Primitive types, okay? We got integer, we got long, we got double for floating points, also you got float, and also character, and boolean, okay? So these are so-called primitive types. So when you talk about primitive types, you don't talk about objects. They are simply just values, just values, okay? On the other hand, did you notice that string is not listed in this category? Did you notice that? String is not a primitive type. String is actually runtime objects you create. Okay? No problem. And then you have reference type. And reference type basically is more complicated. Because reference type, you can, st you can store the address to some memory location. For each object on the memory, you may have as many attributes as you like. So they are now simple, they are more complicated. Okay, so string is one of them. Basically, any class you define on your own is going to be a reference type, any class. Person, points, heap, uh, binary tree, or blackboard, whatever, right? Any, any uh, person, you know, point, scanner, etc. That's about data types, good. Okay, so I think everybody's okay. Again, you'd rather talk to me about your concern before the test, right, rather than after the test. Again, I keep pushing you to talk to me if you got trouble. Okay, so about data types, uh, just another one for about default values, which we also briefly mentioned. So whenever you're trying to declare variables, if you don't have any explicit initialization, they will always keep some default values. Okay, the principle is also very easy. I'll just list them all, okay? If you got primitive type, integer will be zero, double will be 0.0, .0 with a fractional part, boolean will be false, okay? And then for reference type, that's easy. For every reference type or reference variable, if it is uninitialized, it will just be null. Okay, easy. Just null. However, you gotta be very, very careful. We'll see some instances of that, many instances of that. If somehow you have some object reference variable without initializing it using the new keyword, that means it stores the null address, right? And then you try to call a method on some null reference. You will get a so-called null pointer exception. Okay? That's something you will see a lot, maybe in later uh, later part of the course. But I wouldn't talk about it. I assume you have seen some of them already. But we'll get there when we uh, when we see examples. Okay. Uh, any questions before I move on to some principles, and then I'll do examples again. Okay, I want to talk a little bit more about, uh, again, principles about programming, okay? Let's assume, uh, let me just remind you that, remember for our set weights method, we actually got void set weights, just to remind you. That's how we declare the method. And then you have some double value over here, right? that's how you declare that. And then you have some implementation. On the other hand, for get BMI, it returns a double, that's why it's an accessor and then get BMI, okay, no input. Okay, that's our, uh, that's the context for us. So now, we want to know whether I got one, two, three, four, five, six, six different example calls to these methods, and they are being used in different contexts. We want to know which ones may be allowed and which one may not be allowed by the compiler. That's something we want to see, okay? The principle over here, calls to mutate the method, for example, call to set weights, cannot be used as values, which means when you call, let's say, set weights, it does not return any value back to you. 
So, for example, if you say system that all the print line, you are basically expecting something to print out, right? But is Jim the set weights 78.5 going to return anything back to you? No. So this will be considered as a compile time error. Try that. Make sure you don't have that mistake. Okay. Similar. Can any anybody tell me if the second one should compile or not? Second one. While I'm trying to use Jim the set weights 78.5 on the right hand side of the assignments. That means I'm in, what I intend to do is whatever Jim does set weights my return, I'm going to assign that to W. That's what I intend to do. But can I do that though? No, no because set weights a mutator. You can see it returns void, so it doesn't return anything. So this is also a compile time error. Okay. Okay. So now, and what about the third one? That's okay, because, okay, the principle is when you try to call a mutated method, leave it alone. Don't try to use it. Just call it. Okay? That one's fine. Okay, let's try a little bit more. So now, in a symmetric way, whenever you talk about excessive methods, they should be used as value. Should be. I didn't say must be. I say should be. Okay? What about the first one? When you say gym.getBMI, is it going to give you any compilation errors? No. no, I agree with you, no. However, is it useful though? No. Good, because you're, why do you, why do you waste time calculating the BMI without printing it out or storing that to somewhere else? It's useless. Okay, but useless. Very good, very good. I'll write it out quickly. So this is valid, but useless. What you should do instead is, as you can see, try to use it in the context of maybe print line or assignments, right hand side. Okay? That's basically what this slide is trying to tell you. Of course, you have to generalize this to many other scenarios, right? Okay, final page before we go to more examples. I want to give you a little bit more ideas about how you're supposed to design method parameters. This slide here may not be so uh, you, do, you, do, you do not have to worry so much about this slide for this course because always you're given the headers. You're given which method you should create and what should it return and what should it take. You might be curious about what should be the design principles for how many parameters should I take? Should I take no parameters or should I take five parameters, right? So that's uh, something that will go beyond this course. Maybe later on when you go to EECS 3311, software design, to you really come up with your own design, you have to decide how many parameters your method should take, right? That's something a uh, uh, little bit more long term. But I just may, may want to mention that briefly. Basically, for constructor, you've got to really consider how many attributes do I want to initialize. If I want to initialize none of them, like the default constructor, simply leave it empty, no, no parameters. If I want to initialize all of them, let's say all the four attributes, then four parameters, right? Maybe somewhere between. So for example, I may have one constructor, version number one, where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, initialize the weights and heights, only two. On the other hand, I have another version where I'm going to uh, initialize maybe the first name and last name, right? Depends. Okay, similarly, what about mutator? For example, like a, a, let's say set weights or set height, right? Mutator is really about, think about which attributes you're going to change. For example, in the case of set weights, you can see in the case of gain weights over here, we know that this, met oh, this method here is inten intends to change only one particular attribute, which is the weights. That means I should really get this information from whoever is calling this method, right? That's why it does one input. On the other hand, if I want to say I want to gain the weights and height at the same time, in that case, I might need two parameters from the user, right? Maybe height and weight at the same time. So it really depends on what you need. Okay, so I just got another example here. So just uh, about in the point class, you can read it, okay? Finally, about excessive method. Excessive method is really about returning some computational results. Let's say in the case of get BMI. I'll give you a little bit of insight to the get BMI. 
get BMI over here, you can see it takes no parameter. So why is that? Think about what kind of computation you're going to do. Let's say I want to calculate BMI. What does the calculation of BMI depend on? It depends on the weights. It depends on the heights. But those two information, weights and heights, they are already available as the class attributes over here. Over here. So that means that there's no need to take any extra information from the user, right? That means having empty parameter will just be okay because you can simply just refer to this dot weights and this dot height. It will just be enough. Okay? But sometimes you might need some extra information for you to uh, calculate. But we'll see later. Okay, this is just the principle. I want you to always keep this uh, slide handy over here. So later on, you can think about whatever methods that you were given in the lab exercises, or the labs, or the extra exercise I give to you. Think about why the number of parameters are the way it is. There's a reason for that. Think about it, right? You want to think about the design issue, even though it's outside the scope, maybe, for this course. OK, we're going to do more examples, OK? We're going to do more. Let's see how much we can do. Let's do some warm-up exercise, OK? So uh, for the first two, it's just easy. Basically, I'm talking about how we can use the uh, class name as a reference type in different scenarios, OK? But this one, is, uh, this one here is easy. For example, in the class person, I simply declare an attribute spouse of type person, which means the spouse attributes is going to store the address of another person object, right? OK, that's what it means. This one, I wouldn't go into details. OK, and also, Let's say we want un, uh, inside the person, we want to define a mutator. Let's say we want to get married with somebody, right? So now, what should that somebody be, right? I'm declaring whoever you're passing to be married with, other, it should be a, of type person. What does that mean? That means when you are trying to call this method, you should give the address of some person objects, okay? For these two, uh, we will talk a little bit more when we talk about call by value later, okay? But now I want to get into details for the others. Okay, what I want to do is do a warm-up example together with you and see how we can trace it, okay? The main lesson for this example over here is about over here. Let's go over this class very quickly. We have a class called point, two-dimensional, excuse me, two-dimensional point. Let's assume we got two attributes x and y, let's assume. And then we have the constructor points with x and y. And then we have two methods over here, okay? The mutator move up. You want to move the points up by some, uh, by some units, right? So that means you will simply take whatever units you want to move up by and then simply increment the y value by the units, okay? That's a mutator, okay? We can trace that quickly a little bit later. And then over here, I have, first of all, is it accessor or mutator? Accessor, right? How do you tell that? First of all, you can see this is not void. That must be accessor. And also, you got return. OK, that's accessor. Let's try to see what it is trying to do. And then we'll try to trace that a little bit to get some idea. So now, that method there is going to take, let's go line by line. It takes some double as input, and then it, inside the method, we are simply trying to create a new point, to create another point, rather than a context point. And then we try to change something for the new points over here, and then return the new points. That's very informally speaking, without tracing. Okay, read those three lines very quickly. Okay? Basically, we are trying to create a new object over here. Whenever you call this particular method, you're going to create a new point, and then you're going to modify the new point by calling the mutator method, and then you're going to return the address of that new point. That's basically what you're doing. Okay? So now, how do we use this particular method? So this is a method just exemplified how you may have uh, object type, uh, reference type as the uh, return type. Okay? Let me wipe it out, and then let's trace it together. I do have some main method over there for you. Okay, let's try. 
let's say we have a point tester over here, okay? And then, let's say we simply say point P1. This one you should know how to draw, right? Let's draw that very quickly. So now, since we got new points, so we're gonna draw a new object over here. Assuming that we got X and Y, okay? And 2.5, and also minus 3.6, right? Easy. So 2.5 minus 3.6. And then P1 is going to store the address of this object. So P1 is pointing to this object. Oh, that's easy. Okay, so now, first of all, what does it really mean when we try to do P1 the move up 7.8? First of all, are we creating any new objects here? No, okay. And what's the context object here? A context object, not arguments, right? Context object is simply just P1, right? Okay, so now we're saying, for P, uh, we're going to call this particular method called move up over here call that, and then it's gonna be 7.8. So this will be 7.8, a unit is 7.8. So now what's this? What's, what, should, what should this be over here? P1, question. Oh, I kinda, I kinda assume there's a mutator method here. Sorry about that. So basically, let me mention that valid concern. Move up is some mutated method I assume that we simply got, right? You're simply going to uh, increments. Uh, do I have that over there? You know what, let me define that very quickly. Move up by, you know, I'm just not being consistent myself. Can I just do a little bit, can I cheat over here? Can I just say move up, move up by? I'll fix that on the slides, how about that, okay? Okay, good, so now we can trace it. Okay, so now, let's say 7.8 is over here, and now, what's this, P1? So P1.y is going to be, oh by the way, so P for P1, currently, P1 is basically uh, at this point. P1 is simply here, 2.5 minus 3.6, right? And now, after this, we are simply just going to increment the Y value over here by 7.8. Right? That will give you, I believe, 4.2, okay? Something like that. And then, that means rather than uh, existing here, it's gonna be uh, P1, 2.5, and 4.2, okay? We're just moving up over here, right? How do we change the objects? Just change the value over here to be 4.2. The same object stay there, okay? So that's a pink line. Okay, any questions so far? So far, we haven't touched the, uh, the move up by just yet. Let's do that. So now we have over here. And I want you to analyze this line a little bit. You can see over here, on the left-hand side, we are trying to declare a new one called P2. So that means P2 eventually is going to point to something, eventually, okay? Let me just put P2 just for now. And then, where should that object come from? It comes from the return value from p1 dot moved up by. It comes from there. Why could we do that? Because if you look at the moved up by method over here, it's exactly over here. It has the return type points. That's why we can do this, okay? And now let's trace this particular green line a little bit. What does it really mean when we say p1 dot moved up by and then we say 6.4, okay? Let's try that. Okay, what we will do is, context object is P1, right? And then we're going to go to this particular method over here, okay? First of all, let's fill out the context objects. Whenever you talk about this, it's going to be P1. This is going to be P1, okay? And now, 6.4 is the units, 6.4, and 6.4. So far so good? Will there be another object created? Yes, because you can see that, I'm gonna use a different color here. What about, uh, red should be okay, good. So now, uh, what we need to do is, we're gonna 
execute a method line by line. For the first line, we're just going to create locally another MP. MP is basically pointing to a new points over here. Right? It's simply going to be a new points. And then we have x and y. And now what should the value be? P1.x, right? P1.x will be 2.5. And P1.y is going to be 4.2. That's the new object we are creating. Okay? And now we say another thing. MP, which is this object over here, we say MP dot move up by. We're calling this so it should be move up. MP that move up, and then we want to move up by 6.4 units. Okay, so now question Am I changing the red or the orange objects? Red, right? Because MP is a context object. Okay, okay, you're gonna call this the second time. Okay, I'm gonna skip that trace. That means you're gonna uh, move it up. So that will be uh, 10.6, something like that. Just do the addition. Okay, I'm sure you can do it. So now, what does it really mean, finally, to have this line? Return MP. Return MP simply means we're going to return the address that is stored in MP. And then MP is going to be this particular value over here, just MP. This whole thing is going to be just the address MP. So now it's now as if we're trying to do P2 is assigned to MP. We now should know very well, what arrow should we change? Should we change the arrow for MP, or should we change the arrow for P2? P2. P2 is going to point to this object, and MP eventually will be garbage collected because that's local, eventually. Okay? And now, if we say system the outer print line, P1 equals equals P2. True or false? False. Easy. False. Okay, okay it's very... Uh, we a uh, small uh, number of lines, but it does illustrate many things. So please know how to, how to trace such code. Okay? The main essence for this particular code that I want you to pick up is, number one, the return type. Let me highlight it, uh, and then we'll go to the next example. The return type for a method can be a uh, class type. It can be a reference. Number two, within your method, you can also try to create another object and return its address. Okay, number two. Number three, when you are trying to use it, you can see p one up by is going to return the address of a new point object. You can store that into another point, right? That's basically what I'm doing. That's exactly the final arrow I was trying to do over here, right? Over here. That's basically what this example is telling you. Questions? Question, yes. Can, oh, what, what do you mean? Can, can you make it a bit, yeah. What about it? Oh yes, you are basically, okay, you are asking the following question. You are asking for this particular line, let me highlight a different color, the blue one. You were asking, is this method call valid or not, right? The answer is yes, because, because, thinking this way, if you look at MP that move up, first of all, MP over here, what's the type for MP? Point. And does there exist a method called move up in the point class? Yes, that's why you can call that, yes. Okay, I'll, maybe I'll talk a little bit maybe later when we get there, but that's at least for this example, that's why you can make the method call. As long as the context objects support that particular method, you'll be okay. How do you know that if the context object support the uh, method? Look up the context object type, in this case, point, and then to see if the point class support this method. It does, so of course it, uh, you'll be okay. Guys, questions? Okay, we got 20 more minutes, okay? So I would suggest we do the following, okay? I don't think we can finish everything I planned. I plan, planned three things, okay? So I guess we'll just finish one of them. We want to do it well. I don't want, I don't want to uh, go to rush. That's not good for you. 
I would suggest we do this programming pattern together, okay? And then I will talk about anonymous objects static a little bit later. And also, since some of, uh, many of you didn't know about short circuit, I will try to talk about this when we use it, okay? Let's only focus on the programming pattern. This will help you when you try to read the notes I mentioned in the beginning. So the programming pattern I'm gonna talk about is consistent with the notes. I'm just trying to do it together with you so you got more um, reinforcement, okay? But don't skip the reading, okay? Take my advice, I would suggest. Let's now talk about this particular programming pattern. Basically, what we are trying to say is, for the point class, you only got X and Y. X and Y are simply just primitive type, right? But now we want to go a little bit more complicated. What if we have a class called point collector? Literally speaking, it's going to collect points. So now, how many points can we uh, can we store in a point collector? It can be none, it can be one point, it can be two points, it can be three, it can be many points, right? So now, how can we store a number of things? The easiest way is to use an array. Okay? Of course, you may call some library class, maybe array list, uh, maybe a linked list, or whatever. However, I personally believe building the basics from scratch would be the best for you at this stage. Okay, let's use array. Okay? In fact, you will be only, use, uh, only allowed to use array in the lab test. Okay? Again, I was trying to explain to you using uh, the basics to build from scratch is the best for you at this stage. So now what I will do is, let's now try to understand every detail if we could. For this particular, I say a pattern. Basically, every time you want to have a collection of objects, that's what you should do. First of all, I declare a attribute called points, plural, not singular. And then what's the type? It's simply point square brackets. Anybody remember what I, what we actually talked about this already, right? In the uh, aliasing example. Except we say person square brackets, but now we say point square brackets. Anybody want to tell me what point open square brackets, closing square brackets, what does it really mean? It's gonna be an array of, of, type, of type points. What do you mean type points? What, what, what is it gonna store at the runtime? Addresses for person, yes, yeah, okay. Basically, if you look at this type over here, what you can see right away is, is going to be array of person addresses at the runtime. Point. Thank you. Yeah, if I make a mistake, please shout out. Okay. I don't mind. Okay, that's the point. And now the second part for the programming pattern is we want to keep track of to what slot of the array we want to store the new points. I'll, I'll, let me just mention a variable and then we, we'll do that together. It, you need an integer variable over here. I simply call it NOP number of points, just number of points. Okay, let me mention that very quickly. Okay, I'll, maybe we'll trace it and then I'll, I'll summarize what the NOP really is for. Let's try to, again, we have a constructor over here, okay? So we have constructor here. This is a constructor, and then we simply try to initialize the array, okay? And then we have just a single mutator over here called add points. And we simply say given x, given y, we're going to create some new point objects. And then somehow we're gonna store that into the correct spot in the points array, somehow. And we also need to update NOP by incrementing it. If this is your first time seeing it, you might be completely lost, that's okay. But we're gonna trace it and see why it should be done this way. There's a reason for that. Okay, let's now leave the way it is for the code. Let's trace it, okay? That's the complete definition I want you to see just now, okay? Now we have a tester over here. The tester, line number one, let's try to trace it very carefully. Line number one, we try to declare PC to be storing the address of some person, uh, sorry, point collector. And then it's gonna be initialized by causing, calling the default constructor or uh, constructor taking no parameters. 
So now, how do we represent this particular object visually? Okay? How many attributes do we have for the point collector class? How many? Attributes. One and two. Right? Points is a uh, attributes and NOP is the second attribute. So two attributes only. Only two. Okay? And now what I would do is if I call this point collector constructor over here, I'm going to do the following. First of all, I'm going to create a new object over here, point collector. Okay, two attributes. One is points, the other one is NOP. I might need more space over here, so I'm going to move it over here. So, two attributes. Points, NOP. Okay, and now let's try to trace the way we call the constructor, right? Now we can apply the technique we just covered. So now we simply say points. So now implicitly this is really this dot points, right? So what's this? The green objects that we're talking about, this is this, okay? And then when we say this dot points, we're talking about this particular array. We want to assign that to a new point array of size 100, right? So you can think about on the right hand side over here, when we say new point array 100, we're gonna create an array like this, okay? 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way to, okay, 0, 1, 2, 3. What will be the last index? 99, thank you, thank you. And then, and we're gonna assign the address of this starting point array and then assign that to points. So he points to there. Are we okay? Okay, initially, everything here is just going to point to null, initially. Initially. Okay, that's it. So now, question. I did not explicitly initialize NOP. What, would that, what should that be, uh, what should its value be? Zero, thank you. And then, don't forget, we're gonna store the address of this point collector to PC. So PC is going to point to here, right? So far so good, okay. The construct is not too bad, not too bad. Now let's trace the mutator, which is really important. Eventually, you can see that we are trying to make the same method call. Add points, add points, add points, add points, four times. Context objects, PC, 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 the same. Somehow, eventually, we are going to create four different point objects. And then we want to make sure the first object we are trying to add is going to be on the leftmost spot of the array. The second object will be to its right, third object to its right, the fourth object is at the rightmost. That's kind of the thing we want to achieve. NOP in this case is very important. Okay, we'll, we'll see. Let's try to trace. What I will do is I'll try to choose maybe a different color for each one. I'll try. Green, uh, maybe not green, green is ready to use. How about orange first? First one, PC .add points and then three, four. Okay, so now when you try to call the add points for the very first time, okay? So now question, what's the value for NOP? Zero, that means we're updating the slot over here. Agree? Okay, so points at position zero at this point. And then over here, we're going to create a new object of type points, right? Let me create it over here. Points, and then we got X and Y. And now, what should be X and Y? Three, four, right? You should be able to see that, right? Hopefully. Three and four. And now, question. For this assignment here, that means we're going to assign the address for this orange object here assign that to here. That means rather than pointing to now, we're going to point to here. That's good. However, if we do not change the NOP from this point, what's gonna happen? When we try to call it at point the second time? It's gonna override, exactly true, exactly true. So that is why this line over here is so crucial. If we say NOP++, 
That means it's going to, oh, uh, I guess you stick, uh, stick with orange. Increment it to one. So what does one really mean? So now NOP really represent two, uh, for two purposes. Number one, how many points have been stored? At this moment, one point, so that's why NOP is one. And second point, more important, where to, yes, the index is already, that's for sure, where to store the next point. Okay, let's try. Let's do a second call. Okay, let me use uh, maybe pink, okay? Second call, okay? So now, calling the same method with the same context object. So now, we're gonna call this a second time. And now we're gonna do this object here, okay? Gonna create a new point object over here. And then we got X and Y, okay? And then we got minus three and four, agree? Good, and now, what's NOP in this case? One, so that means what we're doing is we're doing points at position one is assigned to this particular pink object. That's basically what we're doing. So now for one here, rather than pointing to here, it's now going to point to this particular pink object. And don't forget, to, in order for the next new point to be added, we have to say NOP++. So from one to two. So now what does two really mean? Number one, two means we have stored two points already. Number two, the next point we want to store is going to be at index two, okay? Think about these two purposes very carefully. You do not want to memorize this pattern. This pattern really nicely illustrates how you can do things from scratch. Okay, so now, can I say it would be very straightforward, can you just predict without tracing so 100% detail? What's gonna happen after this? Are we gonna get another prop, uh, object, right? Another one, point, and then x, y, the third time, right? And then minus three, minus four, and then, now what would be the value for NOP? Two, right? So that means points two is assigned to this particular guy. So now for position two, rather than pointing to null, it's now going to point to this particular object. And then don't forget, increment NOP from two to three. Again, it means two things. Number one, we have stored three points already. Number two, the next new point is going to be stored at position three, the fourth point. Okay, are we good? Okay, okay, good. So now after this, uh, let's just do, I'll uh, just put com com uh, completeness. After this, we're gonna get another point over here. And then x, y is gonna be three and minus four over here, okay? And now NOP will be three, right? So it's gonna be points at position three is assigned to the blue objects. Now, position three is here. Rather than pointing to now, it's now going to point to over here, okay? And then, after that, increment it to four. Okay, it goes on and on and on. Of course, we may have to worry about what if you have already added 100 points, in which case, you have no, way, you have no more space. In that case, you may have to give it a little bit error. We'll get there, don't worry. Guys, any question about this pattern here? Okay. There is a second part for this pattern here, which is about calling the mutator. I will leave that to next Monday. Oh, wait, 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 wait. We got time, right? Yeah. Take, take it easy. Oh, uh, how about, I promise I'll let you go one minute earlier today. I promise. <laughs> okay. I want to mention something quickly, right? Okay. Okay, that's about the programming pattern. I'll revisit this on Monday. However, I want to mention something very quickly for you, okay? For your benefits. Short circuit. It, does, it only takes me about two minutes or three minutes to explain the logic. I want to absorb the logic first, and then we'll talk about examples. So we know that you got two logical operators in Java. You got conjunction, you got disjunction, right? And to define that, you know that this is conjunction, agree? Okay, tell me that's true, okay. So now, I want you to pay attention to the truth table over here. 
So now, basically, you, you can see how can we make a conjunction false? Oh, sorry, let me say it again. How can we make a conjunction true? When both are true, right? If any one of them is happened to be false, it doesn't matter what the other one is, right? The only way to make it true is when both are true. If any one of them happens to be false, you just get false anyway. That's the insight into the table. So now what does that really mean? When I do the following, if I say P and Q, let's say P and Q simply evaluate to Boolean, okay, at the runtime, okay? Let me ask you this. If I know already P is going to give me false, does it really matter what Q is? It does not matter. So that's where short circuit evaluation comes into place. Logically speaking, you have to evaluate P, evaluate Q, and take the conjunction. At the runtime, this is what's gonna happen. Evaluation is going to be from left to right. It's always going to evaluate P first. If P happens to be true, and then do we have to continue? We have to, because it depends on what Q is. However, if P is already false, we do not have to bother for Q. Okay, are you okay with this? Okay, take that thought, okay? What about this junction? Once that's done, we're done, okay? For disjunction, you gotta think about how can we make a disjunction false? How can we make a disjunction false? When both are false, right? It's only if both are false, then it will be false. If any one of them happens to be true, it will just be true anyway. Okay, so now apply the similar logic. If I got P1 or P2 at the runtime, let me ask you in a symmetric way. The evaluation is going to be from left to right. Let's say I evaluate P1. What will be the circumstance for P1 such that I don't have to bother to evaluate P2? If that's true, right? Because if P1 happens to be true as opposed to P1 being, P being false, right? Symmetric. If P1 is already true, that means overall it's gonna be true logically anyway. So we do not have to evaluate P2, we don't have to. However, if P1 happens to be false, we have to evaluate it, right? The short circuit evaluation is very valuable because it uh, makes the first expression the so-called guarding constraint. If the guard satisfies certain either true or false, depends on which operator you're using, you might be able to get around by not evaluating the right-hand side. Okay, we'll see examples next week. Okay, I'll see you next week. <laughs>